I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, please. Matthew chapter 25. There you will find a picture the Lord gives of the judgment. We're only going to notice from verses 41 through 46 of Matthew 25. As he speaks to those who are on his left hand that are pictured as those that are lost at the great judgment day when all men stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, and receive their eternal sentence. In verse 41, Jesus, as Matthew by inspiration records, has this to say in his preview of the judgment. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? <coughs> then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. When you turn to uh, Luke 16, you see this statement made even before the end of the world and the resurrection and the judgment. But the rich man died, and the scripture says in verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Then in verse 24, his response to Abraham was simply this, For I am tormented in this flame. Now what you see depicted before you here doesn't begin to depict the reality of the eternal damnation of the soul in hell. Any more than any kind of depiction an artist might make of the glories and majesty and power of the resurrected, glorified person in the likeness of Christ in glory. Now, you may say, well, why didn't you talk about heaven? Well, we'll get around to that. But I could say this way. Why not talk about the place most people are going to go? Most accountable those accountable to God for their actions, accountable people are going to be in eternal torment. Not only that, I could say this. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us, had more to say about hell than anybody else. Ask yourself the question, why is that the case? Because he does not want us to go there. Just how much does God not want us to go there? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hell is eternal because one, the Bible clearly says that it is eternal. Number two, the same words used to describe the eternality of hell is used to describe the eternality of heaven, of God, and of those who are saved by Christ's blood and obedience to the gospel and die faithful as far as existence is concerned. Then three, sometimes people don't want to recognize this, but God's flawless and perfect justice demands that hell be eternal. Our problem is that we don't see sin like God sees sin. To this day, I doubt any one of us has a horror and attitude towards sin that we ought to have. And yet the place reserved for those who choose to live and die in sin is eternal damnation and devil's hell. So we should want to inform ourselves and certainly others regarding what the Bible has to teach us 
as to hell and its eternal nature. So that being the case, as we preach the whole counsel of God, as we preach the power of God to save the gospel, then we need to show what are you being saved from? You must be saved from your sins. God must do the forgiving for all sins ultimately against God. But he doesn't want you to go to such a place as that. You know, time is not measured in eternity because, as it is here because there's no time in eternity like it is here. I don't know how to describe existing in eternity because all I know how to describe is in a physical world and time told by the sun and so on. You would think almost, since we're still in the first few days of a new year, that all these New Year's resolutions, Happy New Year, and all this kind of thing, really what's changed from the last day of December to the first day of January, except that the world's gone around the sun one more time. I don't think the devil changes any from one day to the next. And God doesn't change any from one day to the next. The gospel of Christ, the power to save men from sin doesn't change. Sin certainly doesn't change. Physical death doesn't change. A person dies five minutes to 12, the last day of December, and a person dies five minutes after the New Year's here. Anything changed? They're either going to a place of paradise, of departed spirits in the Hadean world, or else they're going into torment where the rich men went. And those that go into paradise will ultimately be resurrected in a glorified body to stand before the throne of Christ and receive the good things done in the body. And they were good because they kept the commandments of God. Or they will receive just what we read a moment ago. And notice there's no RIP, rest in peace, for anyone who goes to hell. And there's no, well, I'll spend a while in hell and get out. When you look at what is depicted here, that's the way they're always going to be. Only it's going to be a whole lot worse than that. But it never changes. That's the eternal abode of the wicked. It does not change. All hope is lost for those in inner hell. There's no a million years here and I'll get out. There's no ten billion here and I'll get out. No. That's where it's going to be. And Revelation 21.8 tells about people who have their part reserved for them already in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now what this doesn't depict is the fact that there is eternal darkness. There is a flame that is fitted for the eternal abode of the damned in hell, and yet there's eternal darkness at the same time. Now imagine in that kind of situation. And when I say imagine it, I know when I say it, none of us can really do it. Now from this passage, you can see the eternal, eternality of hell taught. That is Matthew 25, 41 through 46 that we read. There have been in our brotherhood some recent books written by some men with some notoriety that try to teach that eternal hell simply means you suffer from fire from eternity and you just are consumed with it. Jehovah's Witnesses have long taught that. that anybody that's a Jehovah's, not a Jehovah's Witness, that you're just simply consumed by eternal fire and you go into nothingness. But that's not what is being taught here. So I have to ask the question, why would my Lord teach such a thing as this? Because I know to begin with, everything he taught us is for your good and my good. I know he never taught anything that was against me and designed to hurt me. And that should help us even in passages that we consider to be difficult passages. He never taught a thing we didn't need. He never taught a thing out of any other motive than the love of our soul. Now notice further about the eternal nature of God. You'd be surprised how much is really said about it. In Jude 1, well, of course, it's only one chapter. In verse 13, notice how it describes people. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars. What about these people who are such 
terrible people in their false doctrine in, in life. He said, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20 and verse 10, and the devil that was deceived or that had deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You see any ending to that? I think it's interesting that modern man and for a long time people sort of have the devil is ruling in hell and he's not really subject to all those fires and so forth. He's got a pitchfork and a, fork, a pointed tail and hooves and a horns and all that and he's sort of running around poking everybody with a pitchfork. But that's not what this passage says, is it? Because we learn that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. He's going to be tormented just along with everybody else. Now look at the punishments in hell, and you'll see that they're described as being eternal. In chapter 3 of Matthew, in verse 12, Scripture said, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with, watch, unquenchable fire. Now I think we've all built a fire at some time or another, and We've quenched it. we put it out. But this is a fire that is unquenchable. It cannot be put out. In Mark 9, 43 and 44, how important is it that we make all the sacrifices necessary to escape hell and to go to heaven? Well, he likens it to a physical body. And he says, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Why? Who would cut off their hand? It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I would say this in every depiction in words of those who have undergone the resurrection that most all of it has to do with the glorified state of those who die saved but there is a resurrection of damnation and we're reading a description of it here what that body will be like i don't know but it's subject to all the miseries that one could think of remember even in the spirit state the rich man said i am tormented in this flame so there's a flame that burns that has nothing to do with material things Brother Marshall Keeble, in trying to depict hell, used to say it like this, that if a man could leave hell for a moment, he would like to cool off in a bath of lava. And I think that's just another effort trying to get us to see that what torment God has for those who die having spurned his son and in their sins, that you really can't comprehend it. Whatever you can comprehend, it's going to be far worse than that. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, again, the wicked will be there eternally. So Paul writes, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Then again in Matthew 25, 41, as we've just read, then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. In duration, one is as long as the other. We should not speak of, for it's contrary to the teaching of the scriptures about it, of life in hell. There is no life in hell. There is conscious existence. It's eternal death. You never find the Holy Spirit describing hell and those in it as having life. The only ones described as having life, eternal life, which is the quality of life, not just duration, are those that are in heaven. What makes life in heaven eternal is because you're glorified. You're beyond anything that the devil can do because the devil's over in the other place. Suffering, 
forever and ever and as many other evers as you want to put on it. So if God had intended to convey that hell was eternal, how else would he have done so other than, done so other than the, what he said? The same words used to describe the eternality of hell, as I said earlier, are used to describe the eternality of heaven, God, and the eternal life of the saved. Now, God is without beginning or ending. He inhabits eternity. He needs nothing. He's self-existent. He did not come into existence. He is the source of all things good. But as far as existing in eternity, we shall so exist someday. And we've been told before, either in one of two places, either eternal glory in heaven or eternal misery in hell. This is what is said about God. Psalm 90 and verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever there had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Concerning the second person of the, God, uh, of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, whom he became, the incarnate word, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation 1 and verse 18. Then again in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 14. It is said of God and the four living creatures. King James says beast said. Amen. Which means so be it. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Concerning heaven, in Matthew 25, 46, as we've read already several times, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. In chapter 22, in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, in verse 5, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What about the saved? Those who heard and from the heart obeyed the gospel, as we talked about this morning, who live faithful all their lives, many of them like Stephen, giving their lives rather than deny the truth. Well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 6 and verse 23, the gift of God is eternal life. But notice the avenue that you have to travel to have it through Christ Jesus our Lord. John wrote in his first epistle, chapter 2 and verse 25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Question, does God keep his promises? If hell is not eternal, then we can only conclude that God or heaven, and certainly not heaven, is eternal. We must conclude that they're just as long or short as is hell. But they're both described as unending. God's justice, as I said, demands that hell be eternal. I'm glad that there is a just God. Because that means when the time of probation, the time of his mercy is over and done with. That all of those who opposed him, who persecuted the saints, who lived for themselves, who cared nothing for God, who caused all of the turmoil that's been in this world, all of the torture and all the wickedness and all the meanness and all the self-willedness and all the selfishness, there is a meeting of the minds. And it's God's eternal mind in all of his power and righteous glory standing in judgment upon them because God is just. When I hear people say, well, he escaped justice. He may have on this earth, but nobody escapes God's justice. Vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay. Deuteronomy 32, 4 reads, he is the rock. 
His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. You may have all the stuff going on in Congress right now or in any court or all sorts of bribes maybe being taken here and there and people perverting justice because of favoritism and bias and prejudice won't be with God. Won't be at all. In Isaiah 45, 21, the great prophet said, Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none beside me. You know, if America could just learn that, there's none beside God. He is the one, the true, the eternal living God. It would make such a difference. We sometimes pray in God's good providence that men get themselves back to looking for God in this life. Well, it wouldn't make a difference if they would. But when men want to do as they please and live according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they're not too much wanting to think about a just God. They're trying to put that God out of their mind. Talked to a man one time who had lived quite a few years outside of Christ. Well, actually, he was apostate for quite a few years. He obeyed the gospel when he was young. But he left the Lord for quite a few years. But when I knew him, he had returned and had been back in the church for a long time. He had been reared in a home where he knew the Bible and God. That's how he came to know the truth of the gospel and obey it. So I asked him, I said, how in all those years that you were away from Christ, how did you stand it? How did you keep those thoughts coming to mind that the Bible had formed in you that told you where you were headed if you died in that state? He said, well, really, it was quite simple. If one of those thoughts I learned from the Bible that said I stood condemned came across my mind, I immediately ran it out. Ah, the will of man. Does that tell you why a lot of people will do it? Though they may not be that honest to say so, they just drive it from their minds. They will not think about, here's where I am headed and here's where I'm going to be for eternity if I die in this shape. In Revelation 15, 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And making this uh, come before our minds even more now, think for a moment as the redeemed. Those who heard believe the gospel, you're members of the church because that's where the Lord added you. You're covered by the blood of the Lord as you live faithful to him every day. Aren't you glad you have a God like this? He will take care of you. You're his child. And if you as a weak and beggarly person can have the love you have of your own children, your own flesh and blood, how much more so those who have recognized what God did for them to save them from their sins and to save them from hell, how much he loves and appreciates those and how much favor you have from God. So what kind of justice would it be if the wicked were merely annihilated? They just... And are gone. That wouldn't be justice. They would be able to live a life of sin without any fear of retribution. Psalm 10 and verse 13 reads, Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou will not require it. Do you get the message? Men have always been the same. They live lives they know that are contrary to God's will or they don't care to find out God's will. And they say, well, if there is a God, I'll do all right. I heard one of the present uh, people trying to run for president saying that, well, he thought he deserved heaven because he was trying to keep all the guns out of people's hands. 
Well, I would a lot rather have the view that says I try to teach the gospel to tell a person how they ought to live and handle such things, whether it be guns, clubs, knives, or fists. And that's the gospel of Christ. But it shows you the erroneous, ignorant concepts people have of what it, it is to be pleasing to God. They would never ultimately be punished, these who are lost, for suffering that they've caused others. In Psalm 94, 3, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? And that's simply coming from godly people who love the Lord and keep His commandments, but they suffer at the hands of the wicked, either directly or indirectly. And they want to know how long is it going to be before they receive their just desserts. Wicked men, and we usually use people like Hitler and Stalin as examples of that, but there are plenty of others that never reach their height of power and evil who are in the same boat, would actually suffer no worse state than your own Aunt Sally or Uncle Joe who just didn't believe in Christ but lived a good moral life. That's not justice. In Psalm 146, verse 9, The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and the widow. And the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. And because he's not turning all the wicked upside down right now, doesn't mean that he knows the day in the future when he will. Some say that eternity in hell is cruel and unusual punishment. Well, usually these people would like to be God themselves and measure all things. I've often said of the atheist who says there is no God, he's mainly mad because he's not God. But we recognize the need for lifetime punishment even among criminals now. Why? Why would we send one man to jail for, say, five years for a crime, but send another one to jail for life without parole? What does that say about the human mind? It recognizes the need for the proper punishment to fit the crime. So who are we, the ones who are guilty of sin, to say whether God's punishments are just or unjust? He's all-knowing. He knows how to handle it. I'm glad it's out of my hands. All I must do is live like the Bible says and preach it to others and defend it and let God take care of it. Since when do we allow the guilty to determine his own punishment. I always liked it in the days when you had a peach tree or some sort of small bush outside, and when the child got into it, Mama said, you go get me a limb off that tree and bring it to me. That's the kind of decision you get to have. <laughs> well, the punishment was coming, and if you brought back a little bitty old switch about like a blade of grass, that just meant you really got one more after that. So what does that show you how much when we try guilty to determine our own punishment? We know better than that even as mere finite human beings. Does not an offense against an eternal God merit eternal retribution for such offense? After all, who fathered our spirits? Who created a place for us to live? Who's born with us down these thousands of years, giving man time to repent? Well, I just hate he made us. Why did he make us like he made us? Well, he made you a free moral agent. He didn't make you a robot. Robots don't have choice. You have a choice. In fact, that really shows the love of God that he gave you a choice. Because if he didn't love you, he'd just say, I'm going to make you where you're going to serve me. There's no fault process in the matter. There's no choice. There's no free will. You'll just be like one of these vacuum cleaners that runs over the floor on its own. Rather than sometimes we don't think, and most of the time those who are in these uh, positions are those who are engaged in much sin, and they don't want to think about God giving them what they, what they deserve. Next of all, why is it that people, if there is no God, are God's all loving and so loving he would never punish you? Why do they fear punishment? It's because it's built into man to realize when you go against the standard of God, you know what you deserve. When you appeal to people to obey the gospel of Christ, one of the ways you do it 
is to say there is a day in the future when you must come before your God to give an account of the deeds done in the body. And even when you die before the judgment, Luke is telling us in that account that Jesus gave that your spirit steps immediately in if you're lost into a place where you're tormented in this flame. Well, you say, what's the difference then in the judgment? Well, in the judgment, you have the resurrection of damnation if you're lost. And you will receive according to everything you did in this life. It's a time of rewards and of the consequences. Because God's a perfectly just God. So he's going to meet out to you exactly, exactly, without any uh, kind of alteration, exactly what you deserve. Well, those who have loved him and sought his mercy and forgiveness and put into practice the principles of Christian living, you're going to receive mercy on that day. I think one of the greatest blessings that, well, it just, I can't think of it, is to stand there before the Lord and hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I don't know, the devil might be over there saying, he sinned, he sinned, he broke your law. Your justice says you must punish him. But what did Jesus do on the cross? He tasted death for every man. And if we will be faithful to him in obedience to the gospel and faithful to him in the church to which he adds us, the devil has no power over us. And we'll be covered by the blood of the Lamb and receive his mercy. We won't receive justice on that day. We will receive mercy that we claimed while we walk in this life by humble obedience to the gospel and serving him faithfully. So there's no reason for anyone to be in something that's going to be far worse than what this picture depicts. But it's pretty sufficient of itself to imagine in that state, unending, day and night, unending, with his weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Brethren, be honest with yourself. Love the lost and carry the gospel to them. Warn them of where they're headed. And make sure these things help us walk the straight and narrow way that we will never experience such a thing as this because once you experience it, you always experience it. If you're subject to the gospel call of Christ, realizing the eternality of hell and the eternality of glory in heaven, believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, be buried with your Lord in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life, be faithful to Him in the spiritual body of Christ and go home to be with the Lord someday. And escape this place that's made out by the justice, justice of God for all the wicked. If you're subject to the Lord's good invitation, he invites you to come. We stand and sing.